that leaves us about a quarter of an hour during which uh, you may ask questions of the speakers this morning. Um, I'm not sure, perhaps we ought to have the speakers up on the, uh, on the dais here, please. Could we have all this morning's speakers up here? Could questioners please identify themselves? This is going to be obviously uh, videoed, so... Um, Okay, can we have a, a question, please? Yes, in the middle. Then. I am Paul Gerstrand from Denmark. I'm, I'm just a professor in Western Research, a review in Western Research. And I've been with great interest listening to all this good scientific points. When I went to medical school, I didn't know anything about COX-1 or COX-2 whatsoever. Forget it. My point is that if we have an inflammatory status of a course, this is to me, this is to me, or at least in human beings, a sign of something's wrong. We are not talking about infection. A lot of people are misunderstanding inflammation and infection and whatsoever. Something's wrong. And none of you have so far not talked about anything but symptomatic uh, treatment and the effect of symptomatic treatment. Because what does, if you try to make an investigation with rest compared to an NSA so what, whatsoever, what will happen? Because we have a symptom that something's wrong and we do symptomatic treatment with the NSA. Maybe we improve it and they improve earlier, but what about the genuine, uh, what you call that, the genuine uh, treatment of what actually was wrong? I would like a comment to that. Thank you. Who would like to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> Wayne. Well, I don't know if he'd like to respond to it, but, uh, well, first of all, I, we're only covering, we're covering the, you know, what I thought we were asked to talk about was symptomatic treatment, you know, in the context of competition. We do, you know, we do a lot of diagnosis-based treatment um, uh, in terms of arthroscopic surgery, you know, further diagnosis. So, yeah, that all goes on. You know, I had it quickly in one slide where I talked about that, you know, when I, when I had the slide up that 60% of uh, lameness problems are related to osteoarthritis, that leads to all the interventional therapies we need, whether it's a chip fragment or that needs removal or a slab fracture that needs repair or OCD in a young animal that needs to be treated. Like, that's all based on a specific diagnosis and a specific uh, treatment. So. We do have all those other interventions, it's just that I stayed within the context of being on the front line with a horse in competition, and I thought that was the topic we were discussing. Okay, another question, please. Yes, on the front row here, please. Do we have the microphone down? Again, could you identify yourself, please? I'm Mary Scalay, Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. Um, this again is for Dr. McElraith, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, referencing the slide that you showed with the cartilage stain with SOFG and um, the discussion about the topical diclofenac, I noted that the control cases had a higher mean score than the phenylbutazone tra treated cases, and it appeared to me that there was actually cartilage defect showing in the phenyl phenylbutazone treated cases. Does this suggest to you that there is a, a degradative effect by the administration of phenylbutazone? Yeah, and, and I, I showed the scores there. The answer is there's a trend. It wasn't statistically significant, whereas the positive effect with the diclofenac was a positive effect. I think that 
you know, with more exploration, we could show it because that was the first in vivo uh, test of phenylbutazone on articular cartilage. And I think that uh, it's important because there's been a number of in vitro studies. And as I put the slide up, <coughs> it's controversial. But I think long term use, um, we feel that that gives evidence because those horses went for. Uh, it's a 70-day study, from, and from day 14 to day 70, they got two grams of phenylbutazone per day uh, for that whole time period. So we did show a difference, and it was below the you know, statistically significant p-value, but it was a difference. So my answer is yes, and that's why I was raising the point of disease modifying in addition to symptom modifying. Yes, I would like to make a comment on clinical trials. For regulatory purposes, in Europe, and I think in FDA also, they require non-inferiority trials. Meaning the drug company has to demonstrate <coughs> they are not worse than the reference drugs. They have not to demonstrate they are equivalent, and they don't demonstrate they are better. And we have some evidence now that you can, be, you can succeed a non-inferiority trials, and you are worse than a placebo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another yes. question, please. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in the middle there. <clears throat> Sorry, is that microphone on? Yes, it seems to be. Uh, in fact, assuming... Please, Francois, will you identify yourself? Francoise has Switzerland. If I understood well and if I simplify, so the NS ideas would work because they accumulate in inflammatory, at an inflammatory site. So at least we, could, we can say that a healthy horse don't need them because they cannot accumulate somewhere we may have only negative effect from them. And assuming we allow them to be given to our sport horses, it means that we recognize that all our horses uh, suffer from inflammation. So I don't know if you follow, so where do we have to, to reflect about? And I think if we assume that all our horses uh, suffer from inflammation, then we may allow some anti-inflammatory drugs, but we should also ask them to have regularly rest. This was my comment. So the, the, the question is, I guess, um, whether we need to do this if our horses are competing, are they all inflamed, or should we be offering them rest rather than... Perhaps I'm, I can make a comment on the specific accumulation. It has been demonstrated using some tissue cage, etc. Of course, there is some discrepancy between plasma concentration and local concentration. <laughs> but at the end of the story, the two are parallel. And if I understand what you say, said that if there is no inflammation, no, no accumulation, those, those, the, the, the duration of infection is very short. It is a little bit what you want to say. But I will say, if you have no inflammation, why to, to use non serodon anti-inflammatory drugs? <coughs> if there is nothing, do nothing. Ludwig. Um, the other, um, it, it's very dependent upon uh, the non steroidal you are using as well, depending on the, the chemical structure and the PK, and um, the, some of them would tend to accumulate more than others. So, again, that's, we cannot generalize for all the non steroidals. So, that's a, a, a little difference as well. Uh, yes, another question further back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Janice Stradley from the British Equestrian Federation. I'm sorry, this is another, another question for Ms. Dr. Markill Wraith. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, I did note that you used a slide um, which stated that, um, of course, NSAIDs were not prohibited substances <coughs> under WADA. Um, I think, really, is it not correct that that is actually the crux of this problem? 
that NSAIDs are not for humans prohibited substances because humans have the ability to assess whether these substances are likely to cause long-term damage to themselves and to decide for themselves whether they take them. And isn't the crux of the issue here that we are putting our judgment for the welfare of the horse in that place because the horses can't either think or express that judgment for themselves? Wayne. <laughs> you want an answer? <laughs> well, first thing is, is that it's an old one, you know, irrespective of what Watt is doing. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people say that, and that's been the, 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 the argument, and I'm not on either side of the argument. I wanted to point it out, and the main reason I pointed out what Wada's statement was is that due to a lot of shellacking that we've had in racing, I'd finally decided that it doesn't really matter what we think, veterinarians think, um, and at least with AAP involvement in horse racing, it doesn't really matter how much we could argue for the therapeutic value of our medications, the bottom line is that uh, uh, the public uh, always compare us back to a no drug rule and they won't tolerate it. Now, that's why I was quite surprised to see, I felt that the playing field was a little different. Well, that's probably the wrong word to use. The, the context was a little different when we came to what we're considering, this meeting's considering over these two days, in that at least we could fall back. If we wanted to argue for the value of some level of NSAIDs, we could at least fall back in that the humans were doing it. Now, the point you raise, so that's one comment, you know. In other words, I only put it up there because at least we have something to compare to that uh, probably allows us, well, I think personally, it's obviously a personal opinion, gives us a little bit safer ground than what we've had in racing in the U.S. where people have been using anabolic steroids when they're already banned in human, such, for example. The second part of the thing you bring up is an old argument, and I always tell the story, or I've told the story a lot, with regards to humans making decisions about their own bodies and their own health. There was an article in Sports Illustrated, and I'm sorry I haven't got the year up, but I've got it, I've got the copy of the article in my file. They asked elite athletes, elite human athletes, two questions. They did this survey. The first question was, if you could use a performance enhancing drug and it would not be detected, would you use it? 98% said yes. <coughs> the second question was, if you could use a performance enhancing drug, it would not be detected, but it would kill you in five years time, would you use it? 50% still said yes. <laughs> and, you know, so I, I think we're all about the welfare of the horse and we have to make those decisions. We're the steward for the horse. And so it's not taken lightly. And I know I've heard it many times what you just offered up. And, you know, you certainly take it seriously, but uh, it's our responsibility because they can't make the decision. And there are beneficial effects as well as potential negative ones. Right, well, I think on that, um, this is just the first session, so I think on that note, we should draw this morning's session to a close. I'd like you all to thank the speakers who I think have done a wonderful job in the traditional manner. Thank you.